Save 10% with my code BOBBY10 on raw, organic, grass-fed and grass-finished freeze-dried organ meats from Grassland Nutrition. Link in the description box. All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, if you've been following my journey, you know I'm critical about hadiths. That being said, I'm not a scholar, I'm doing my own research. However, coming from Christianity and seeing how scripture can be corrupted by certain people, such as Paul, I have to be cautious and critical. Nevertheless, I'm the first one to admit that I'm coming out of ignorance because I haven't read all the hadiths. I was critical and ignorant about the Quran and then I read the whole Quran and my mind was changed. The same could be said of course about the Hadith which I am reading right now. Today we're going to react to Meet the Genius behind the great Sahih al-Buhari by the channel One Path Network. Al-Buhari is a man that I heard many controversies about but yet again I haven't researched deeply so I'm very excited to watch today's video guys. With no further ado let's have a look. Sahih al-Bukhari, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, literary works ever produced in the Islamic world. Second to the Qur'an, Sahih al-Bukhari is the most authentically transmitted book, although some have tried and failed to scrutinize it. Its name carries so much familiarity that it's so hard for any Ahmad, Muhammad or Aisha to go to any lecture and not hear it being referenced. The same goes for our schools and homes. It's that famous and relevant. But why? Why is Sahih al-Bukhari so important to everyday Muslims such as you and I? And why is it the most quoted book in the Islamic world? Well, to answer these pressing questions, we first need to go back in time and understand who the author is. Let's find out. Let's, please. All I know is he was from Persia. Imam al-Bukhari or Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari was born in 194 AH in Bukhara, Khorasan, which is modern-day Uzbekistan. Hmm. His father was See? a well-educated, respected wrong. man among his peers wrong. and family. He wasn't a scholar of hadith, but he did dabble in hadith here and there when he learned under the hands of Imam Malik and others alike. Unfortunately for the Imam, his father had passed away soon after his birth. Fortunately, his family was middle class and his father left a sizable inheritance for the Imam and his family to live from. As a child, the Imam was distinguished from his peers and had accomplished what most didn't. He had seen as a young lad a dream of him standing in front of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, swatting flies, protecting the Prophet. When he had told his Sheikh about this dream, he said that the Imam will ward off fabricated hadiths just like how he warded off those flies. That's why at the age of 12, he had memorized 7,000 hadiths along with all the chain of narration. Oh. And by the age of 14, he had soaked up all the hadiths he could in Bukhara. He had used up all the scholarship and knowledge in his local province. So when he had the opportunity to go to Mecca with his mother and brother, he couldn't say no. At this time, Mecca had some of the most famous scholars teaching at the time. That's why when his mother and brother wanted to leave, he wanted to stay. He wanted to stay and squeeze every drop of knowledge from the scholars. For over a decade, Bukhari would float in and around Mecca and Medina, excelling in academia at a very early age. In fact, at the age of 18, he authored his own book, and not just any book, a nine book volume on the science of Ilm al-Rijal or the science of men. This science is generally considered one of the most advanced sciences in the field of hadith as it deals with the biographies of the narrators of hadith. That's to really amazing, day, man. This text I is the primary this. source of reference for understanding the lives of narrators of hadith. Again, out of my ignorance, all I heard about Buhari is that he was a Persian living in Persia and then hundreds of years after Prophet Muhammad, he compiled hadiths and that's that. No mention about Mecca or Medina. This really makes me think. One thing to know about Imam Bukhari that most people didn't know is that he wasn't just a specialist in hadith. He was also a master of theology and fiqh. After he had exhausted the knowledge in Hijaz, he then traveled to Baghdad, 
the capital of the Abbasid Caliphate. It was there where he met the greatest Hadith scholar alive at that time, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Imam Ahmad had praised Imam Bukhari, saying that he had never seen anyone from the entire province of Khurasan like him, although Imam Bukhari had not reached his peak scholarship at that time. As a student, Bukhari was truly like no other. Where all his peers would carry notes, Bukhari sat in his classes empty-handed, just listening. His notes were kept all in his head. Wow. It was very memory. common and often that Bukhari would correct his teachers just from his memory. His legendary memory had reached far and wide. So one day, some scholars had come together to test if the rumors were true and invite the Imam to a hadith reading circle in the Grand Masjid of Baghdad. The scholars recited 100 hadiths in front of the Imam. Only unbeknownst to him, the chains of narration of the hadith were mixed and matched with the actual text of the hadith. So basically, all the 100 hadiths narrated seemed outwardly correct, but were in fact completely wrong. Each scholar would read some hadith and ask the Imam if he knew them. He replied, no, for all 100 hadiths. As you can imagine, this would look quite awkward for a great scholar of hadith like Imam al-Bukhari. However, when the scholars were done with narrating, one by one, the Imam began to repeat all the incorrect hadith in the exact order to the same scholar who narrated it and pointed out the exact error of the narration. The entire masjid was shocked and impressed to say the least. This account will cement the legendary preciseness of Imam al-Bukhari's knowledge. That's not the only reason why Imam is beyond Bukhari impressive, is man. So famous. It reminds me of Dr. Zakir Naik and his photographic memory. Some people are truly gifted. We can't even comprehend how their brains work. You see, the Imam was sitting in one of the teaching circles of his teacher, Ishaq ibn Rahaway, a respected scholar of Hadith. Sheikh Ishaq mentioned that it would be such a good idea if somebody wrote a book concentrating only on the Sahih Hadith. This idea sparked a light bulb in Imam Bukhari's head and it never left him. And that's when he wrote Sahih al-Bukhari. This task was so monumentous that no one before him had attempted such a feat. It took Bukhari 16 years to write. Five of those years were in Basra, Iraq. And the final years were in Medina as he wanted to have the blessings of living in Medina. Bukhari had to sit down and sift through 600,000 hadiths he had memorized and find the hadiths that would pass his tough, strict criteria so that it may fit perfectly in his book. So what were the wow. criteria that Bukhari set for himself? Well, for one, Bukhari made sure that each and every one of the hadiths had a connected chain. This means that every narrator in a chain of narration has heard directly from the narrator above him. So for example, Imam Malik narrates from Imam Nafi, who narrates from Ibn Umar, who narrates from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imam Malik is the student of Imam Nafi. Imam Nafi is the student of Ibn Umar. And Ibn Umar heard from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because we can affirm that each narrator has met and directly heard from each other, we can consider this a connected chain. And another condition is that the narrator must be trustworthy, reliable. Meaning, he or she has to be a Muslim, mature, of sound mind and obedient to Allah. Also, the narrator must be precise, mean. Even though this is extremely impressive, the photographic memory beyond any words. However, when it comes down now to people, I personally cannot put my faith in people. No matter how trustworthy, how mature, how much of a sound mind they have, ultimately they are not God, so therefore they are open to error. It always brings me back to the game that we played in school called telephone. You simply whisper something into your neighbor's ear and then at the end of that chain something totally different comes out yet again. And this is in a matter of a few seconds, in a matter of a few minutes maybe, and not over hundreds of years. This is why it is so hard for me to believe those men. If he is not infallible the after all. From memory, 
then obviously his memory must be sharp and precise. Lastly, the hadith must not have a hidden defect such as unknown narrators or it is undetermined whether the narrators met in the first place. But the one condition that Bukhari set for himself in compiling the Sahih that set him apart from all other authors was that the narrators of a chain must prove that they have met. It's because okay. of these stringent conditions that Bukhari that narrows it down. at the formation I admit. of Sahih Bukhari that made it the most authentically compiled book after the Qur'an. One thing to mention about Sahih al-Bukhari is that he never wrote a commentary, not at least in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. Imam al-Bukhari wrote the commentary in the chapter headings and sometimes included other hadiths. Overall, out of 600,000 hadiths that the Imam had memorized, only 7,275 survived his tough, stringent criteria, including repetitions. If that fact didn't impress you, then here's another that probably will. Imam al-Bukhari said, For every single hadith that I chose, I made wudu and prayed two rak'ah in the rawda of the Prophet for every single hadith. That means that the Imam prayed 7,275 istikhara prayers or a total of 14,550 rak'ahs before he completed the book. All this work. I find that beautiful, but not necessarily confirming. I know many people that do pray, but still fall into error. I'm not saying that he fell into error. However, I'm not taking this as proof for the hadith. Dedication and sacrifice culminated in one of, if not the greatest works in Islamic history. This is why the Imam was careful not to let any rumor or any distorted narrative tarnish his reputation and so discredit all his scholarly achievements. His character was exemplary to say the least. He was known to be so unconcerned with worldly matters that he would often be cheated of money and would forgive the cheats after the fact, often sacrificing great sums of wealth so that there wouldn't be even the slightest possibility of trading his akhirah for his dunya. Although Bukhari was revered and loved by the people, he wasn't loved by all. Upon his return to Bukhara, all students flocked to his knowledge circles and classes. This left one scholar, Muhammad ibn Yahya al Thuhali, rather jealous as all his students had left him, including his most prized student, Imam Muslim. Al Thuhali had slandered Imam al Bukhari, calling him a heretic and that no one should learn under him. Seeing as Al-Thuhali was a local sheikh who was well regarded by all in Bukhara, this caused quite the commotion. Imam al-Bukhari was understandably deeply hurt by this. At the same time of this religious drama, a political one ensued. Once the governor of Bukhara knew of Imam al-Bukhari's arrival, and that is my exact point, because I like to believe that he was this good, pious man. But yet again, you see this conflict arising between people. And this is exactly my issue here, that people will always backstab each other, fabricate certain things. How can we trust people? He invited him to come to his palace and teach his children. The Imam respectfully refused when he said, this knowledge is for Allah and it's available for anybody to take it, but I will not sell it to anyone. Time and time again, Bukhari refused to educate the governor's sons in private and leave the rest of the people. The governor was very angry and rumors began to swell that Bukhari was about to be expelled. The situation became so tense that on Eid al-Fitr, Bukhari decided to leave his hometown. But before he left, he made a dua. He said, O oh Allah, this earth, despite its vastness, has become tight for me. So if you feel it better, then take my soul now. So as the Imam was making his way out of the city, he died before he ever made it out in 256 AH. Today, you can see his grave in Bukhara, Uzbekistan. Ibn Khaldun said, I heard from my teachers and different scholars that it is a debt on the Muslim Ummah to write a commentary of Sahih al-Bukhari. Imam al-Bukhari has left an undeniable mark on the Muslim world. His memory was legendary. And by modern day definition, he most likely had photographic memory. This is a rare gift given to him by Allah. Sure. 
but the Imam gave us a tip on how to memorize hadith that we might want to take note of. He said, the way you keep hadith memorized is by acting upon it. I ask Allah to make us of those who consistently practice the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and I ask Allah to have mercy on the great Imam Muhammad Ibn Ismail Al-Bukhari. Ameen. All right, and this is it for today's video. Yes, I know I'm extremely critical about this, but only because I already explained this in the beginning. I am coming from a Christian background and therefore I cannot put my faith into men. Looking at what Paul has done, has fabricated and how this altered Christianity, I of course have to be skeptical when I'm looking at hadiths. I'm not doubting his photographic memory. However, he still had to work with hadiths that he found and they were attributed to certain people. Therefore, he had no direct proof that those really were the words of the people spoken. However, he memorized those things that he read. Yet again, amazing photographic memory, but that doesn't prove for me that it is truly what the prophet said or truly what certain scholars have said. But either way, that is a personal issue that I will have to work out by myself. Ultimately, there is no way around it. I will have to finish reading Sahih al Buhari by myself to really comprehend what is going on here. When I read the Quran, I felt guided. I felt it to be revelation from God. Complete revelation, I have to say. I personally didn't feel the need for any addition to it. However, yet again, I keep an open mind and, as I said, I will read it by myself and then I will make a judgment upon it. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. If you liked it, leave the thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support this channel, all the links are in the description box below, guys. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. As always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.